We have so many exciting medical technologies to discuss. Uh, there's, there's no shortage of them. But the one that's really top of mind right now, I think, is artificial intelligence. And uh, Deborah, I'd love for you to share a little bit more, because there was some news this morning around Watson helping actually understand the safety of pharmaceutical mm -hmm. drugs. And mm -hmm. I'd love for you to share a little bit more in detail on how that's actually taking place. OK, thank, thank you, Lena. So could I? I think I want to explain a little bit of cognitive and what we think of it, and then I'll go right into patient safety. So I think first, when we talk cognitive technologies, we're saying that the technology reads, the computer reads for you. It understands what it reads. It is continually learning. It never forgets what it learns, really, never forgets. And then it, it, it makes a probability of what the answer is. Um, and so our, our business in Watson Health is really to take that technology and data and apply it to the world's most pressing healthcare challenges. So one of those is patient safety. So our, our very good partner, Celgene, who really built their business off, you know, built is, is a, a, a founding premier thought leader in patient safety came to us and said, you know, we think we can do something with cognitive technologies and patient safety. Why? Why is it so important? So the Food and Drug Administration gets about 1.4 um, million adverse drug events a year. And these are largely, they, they are reported by the drug companies. You know, and, and so there's just, there's just in the finding of the adverse events, where can you find them? Because someone, someone might report an adverse event on Facebook, or they might report it on Twitter, or they might report it in some other social media. How do you get to those? It might be reported in an electronic health record, but it might be reported in a way that you didn't typically see it before. Or um, it could be reported directly to the life sciences company. So the first part of this is how can we use Watson to actually find those adverse events? And if you find them and you find more of them, then Watson will make the connections and find patterns in those connections and, and get the answer back to the life sciences company faster so that they can act on it. And then also, you know, there is a lot of, of work going into reporting on adverse events. How can we make that automated so that life sciences companies can understand the adverse events, can act on the adverse events, and, and can report them faster? You know, this is going to have a profound impact on patient safety. We are very passionate about that, but it's also going to have a profound impact on, on new drugs and new drug discovery, and what can we do about that? So, well, so we're, tra we're talking about drug safety here, but is Watson eventually going to be reading my ultrasound? I mean, what's... Wow, I'd you love know why it is. It is. So actually, a bigger question about artificial intelligence and how far it can actually go. Yeah, so we, we will be reading your ultrasound. In fact, we're already reading ultrasound. So we, um, one of the reasons that IBM built this business unit of Watson Health is because a decade ago, IBM and IBM Research actually started reading images in IBM Research. And when you're talking machine learning, time matters. We started looking at cardiovascular images and at breast images, really hard to read images. The heart images are moving and breast images are notoriously hard to, to read. Um, and so we're reading right now today ultrasound images not of, of, of babies but of hearts. And one of the first imaging applications that we'll come out with when we get clearance on it is aortic stenosis. Turns out um, aortic stenosis is missed 30 percent of the time in a heart ultrasound. But at, Watson has learned how to read those. And so what a help it's going to be to the cardiologist, the radiologist, the doctor to say, hey, look, you know, you're reading this image, but look here, because we see something here. And look right here. Just to help, if it's that hard to read, that it's missed sometimes, we can be a learned colleague to say, look here. What's your perspective, Jennifer? You think it's fabulous. <laughs> I want to say it's fabulous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> But I can't. I mean, I, it is. It is fabulous. Yes. And I think that what I love about this conference is we're gathering with sort of this master of university group with some sort of breakthrough pill to cure all inventions and AI. Sort of, it's the American dream, right? There's this thing. You build it. You eat it. And boom. You know, and, and the early Watson work is like that. It's with Mayo. It's, it's kind of this 
long pole in the temple uh, kind of work. The truth of the matter is that artificial intelligence and all real major innovation starts in the hinterlands. It starts with low-level garbage that runs through it in massive volumes. So the guys at Facebook, is a, they're looking at stupid cat carry dog upstairs videos, right? And then trying different taglines and getting smarter and smarter and smarter about how to in, you know, forecast and interpret what might happen, beginnings of intent analysis. At Athena, we're doing, you know, we're kind of the, we're the low end of the healthcare food chain. We're community hospitals and community practices and primary care groups and, you know, ortho groups, kind of not university teaching NIH grant type places. Uh, and our intent analysis is on faxes. We still get eight, our clients get eight million faxes a week. Faxes. Like, has anyone here gotten a fax? <laughs> not me. We get eight, I mean, I, we, the royal me, we, Athena, eight million. Me personally, one when we went public because there was a suspicion by the SEC that the signature on my paper form for the IPO was not a wet ink signature. And they asked me to, they faxed me to have them resend a wet ink signature. So that was a thing uh, that happened to me. But, uh, <laughs> But I think, I think that what we need, what I wish for Watson and what I wish for people to talk about AI is to get, you, you need to sort of set yourself up in a business model where you can continuously have access to enormous volumes of, of kind of decision points mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. lots of insight about what happens after the decision point. Mm -hmm. So you need mm -hmm. tons and tons and tons of paid claims data and then tons and tons and tons of clinical decision moments that happen before that paid claims data. So you can say, you chose drug A, and this guy chose drug B, and this guy ends up with, you know, 3% more of his patients in the, uh, in the hospital than, than, than this girl over here who chooses B, whatever it may be. But that kind of, it's, it's, it starts with very rudimentary. We're talking about matching orders to results, reading payer EOBs, matching, uh, you know, so we've come up with, across the labs that we deal with for our clients, 96 different 96 different definitions of the CBC, mm -hmm. the most basic, mm -hmm. but all of them mean a different thing for all of the different laboratories. There are more appointment types, like to make an appointment with the doctor, than there are ICD-10 codes in Athena. So beginning to get at the granular level of appointment, prescription, order match to result, that is where the really interesting intent analysis, the really interesting platform level uh, artificial intelligence will be born. And you know, the dream, what Watson has been, what I love about Watson was like when Microsoft came up with the word the cloud and put $400 million in that ad. Come on kids, let's go to the cloud. Remember that ad? We're like, let's be cloud-based because Microsoft already bought the ads. Uh, and, and IBM has done that with, with, you know, I'm not sure that Watson has really had that conversation with Bob Dylan, but it sure does get yeah, our no, imagination actually, going. Actually, we did have that conversation with Bob Dylan, but you know, okay, so well, I think I think it's all on, true. Then I think I, you're I on was, a very I was, important I my point. Remarks. Because can can I just check cancer for a moment? Is yeah. that all right? So uh, you know, if we were just if we were just going to stay and be a learned colleague to oncologists at the most premier um, cancer institutions in this country, we wouldn't be doing a very good service. So actually, what, what the idea of Watson for Oncology is actually to get into the ground floor. And so Watson for Oncology right now is being implemented in actually 29 Asian hospitals. And what are we doing there? Do, we know we know that um, first-line cancer treatment is, is right 25, 30% of the time, and that's in this country. In, and that's in metropolitan areas in this country. When you get to rural areas or you get to places where there's, they're hopelessly short of oncologists, to have a tool, a cognitive tool that says, okay, hey, I read the electronic health record, I looked at the image, I maybe looked at the gene sequencing of this cancer tumor, and this is what Watson recommends, green, yellow, red, for cancer treatment for this patient. And we're not just doing this in New York City or Boston. 
We're doing it in, in rural cities in India, in China, and in, in this country. And that democratizes healthcare. And it really, that is the promise of AI. Not that we are going to replace people, not that we're going to replace it's okay. doctors. We're friends here. That, of course you're going to replace them. <laughs> but that we, we really augment the intelligence and in, in, in help. I want to ask an important question here, though. But this all sounds great, and, and the ambition is wonderful. But what happens when the machine's wrong? I mean, if, if Watson... Well, but what she made, wrong, she gently slipped in the really important point, which is the human is wrong so freaking off, <laughs> often, it's a massacre. It's just spread out in sure, little digits. And the human is accountable for that, but... Not really. <laughs> no, nobody's ever goes after but the radiologists. The they're, wrong, they're wrong so often, we don't blame them. It's a, it, so we're, they're trying to go the from... machines can do it better. Well, I don't Today, know. They can't I, do I don't. The, Dr. Tally, what jump in. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I so. think we have a difference in approach, but a, a shared vision of the destination, right? Th th this is, you know, you can go after the destination with one of these moon shots. Everyone loves moon shot. We're going to get it done really fast and spend a lot of money. And Athena, when we started, like, let's do a swarm. Let's fix it. You know, nothing really. I mean, I guess, you know, Manhattan Project, a few things we sort of did moonshot style. And that's one approach. The other is more of a bottoms-up, very humble, grassroots, using this technology on fundamental low-end stuff that we don't care if it's wrong right. that much. Either way, where it goes is, is profound and marvelous and very much like the ads. Like, All right. Well, let's let the doctor weigh in here. <laughs> so, oh, you know. no. We're going to ruin medicine with a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> so it's an end user, actually. You know, the fact is that with more and more subspecialty uh, training, you really are a lot more accurate, right? I mean, when we see patients coming through the door, 99.5% of the time, you're going to know exactly what's going on. It's that 0.5% that really baffles you. And actually, it's not just the subspecialist, right? So what happens is that 0.5% is also that patient that actually went to the primary care provider, and that provider actually was baffled, and so that patient went somewhere else and then got somewhere else before it got to the right specialist. So right. the fact is that, you know, 99.5% uh, of the time, you're going to be okay. It's that 0.5% when people are actually baffled, where you don't know what's going on. That's where Watson comes in. That's it's actually a great tool. Because and that's, that's, a, that's augmented intelligence. That's what we mean that's by exactly augmented right. intelligence. It's augmented that's intelligence. Right. You're not going to go to Watson for your common everyday problems. Mm -hmm. The physician won't. Now, the great thing about it is that it's also accessible to the public, right? Like what you're saying, you're going to have a democracy out there in terms of making sure that you can take care of your own symptoms. But right now, for that 0.5%, physicians are going to be able to go into Watson and say, these are the things that are going on. Can you help me out? And it does help you out. Mm -hmm. it actually Could does I ask help a question, though? Wouldn't you trust Watson more at the super low end? Like, what about, forget brain scans and cancer, like, silhouettes. What about plain films and broken bones? Like, wouldn't Watson be a lot more reliable at that? And isn't that billions and billions of dollars of some radiologist looking at things and saying, yep, that's a broken bone? Like, couldn't well, you, you know, start at the no, low end? Thing, if you look at, if you take a, if you take a CT image, you know, and a yeah. CT, uh, CT studies, maybe 80, 80 images deep, right? And really a radiologist likely doesn't have to look at 74, 75% of those images, but they need to look at the images that there's something on. And so what Watson can simply do again, because we, we are not going to, we are not going to replace the radiologist. I don't think, but, but what Watson can do is say, don't look at these 76 images. Look at these four images. And by the way, here's these four images. Here's the associated Athena health record text that you want to look at too. And here's what you can look at to make your definitive diagnosis quicker, faster. That's how we help. I want to open it up for questions in just a moment. Um, but, but I also want to talk a little bit about some of the futuristic technology that you're working on, Dr. Atala, which is 3D printing. Yes, and there's really yes, some so really important things cool. that you're doing. Um, could you share what, what is the most forward, futuristic thing that you're working on right now? We know really the, the fact is how can you actually get more tissues and organs into patients? You know, we now have a very major health crisis in terms of the shortage of organs. In fact, the American Hospital Association has declared the organ shortage a major public health crisis. And that is because we just, you know, we're living longer, we're aging better, and the longer we live, the more your organs will fail. So there's just major need. In a 10-year period, 
the actual people on the wait list has doubled waiting for a transplant or an organ. In the same time period, less than 1% increase in number of transplants. So there's this dire need of extra tissues and organs. So that's where this field comes in that we call regenerative medicine. How can we actually create tissues and organs using the patient's own cells? So the concept is you go to the patient, you take a very small piece of tissue of the organ, you take the cells that count, that matter, you expand those cells, recreate the organ, and put it back into the patient. What are some of the organs that you've been able to create? So we now have, in patients, we have about, uh, in patients we have uh, skin, engineered skin, um, we have engineered urethras, we have engineered uh, cartilage, uh, engineered bladders, uh, muscle, uh, bladders, uh, vaginal organs, kidney cells for therapy. So these are some of the things that we're doing right now where we're actually creating the organs. We have about uh, seven or, of these. So we have actually created tissues from the patient's own cells and put them back in. But all these were created by hand. So these were actually, we take the biopsy, we take it to the manufacturing facility, we expand the cells, we recreate the three-dimensional construct, we then put it back into the patient. So the concept it really is, how can we automate it? How can we scale it up? And that's where 3D printing comes in. I want to open it up that's for questions tweet. just to see if there's <laughs> anyone, I could, oh, it looks like there's someone right here in the middle. Yeah, there's a question, uh, let's see, for Deborah. So this question about Watson and where is it really most helpful? So um, at, uh, at our medical center at the University of Utah, uh, there's uh, great concern about the undiagnosed disease. These are kids or patients that come in and they're passed around and nobody can figure out what's wrong with the person. Very expensive, very grueling, and uh, unsettling to the to the families. So, does Watson have a track record? Has it been applied to that kind of circumstance, and has it helped? We um we haven't we haven't looked specifically at that. Let me tell you what we have done. Jonathan was was mentioning about having this electronic health record and claims data. So we have now uh, about 100 million electronic health records in the Watson Health Cloud, and about 200 million insurance claims. What people are using, and that data is not just for IBM. Part of this whole mission was to democratize data, get collect a whole bunch of data and have that data for IBM to use, and then our partners like Celgene to use as well. So what our partners can do with that now, and Boston Children's did a, 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 a program on this, is go into the real world evidence and see. I have I have um, a rare disease that looks like this. What does all that data in the, the lives that you have in your database, how does it compare? And Watson makes connections of dots. So we can see this patient who presents this way, um, male, female, uh, male, female, this genotype, this drug, this outcome, and we can match pass through. So not a particular, I think this is Jonathan, not to a particular uh, a patient comes in. We haven't done that real world work yet. You can see in the future that could get there, but now we are looking at what we have to find out from the data in the, in the Watson Health Cloud that we have. I think the, the thing I was stumbling through trying to, the point I was trying to stumble through making is if we start with big data as the idea of how big can I get a data set and how real time, the ability to apply artificial intelligence I mean it's rare and it takes special people and IBM has a lot of them and other people do too and but, but the key is to create a context where there's a huge amount of information that's relatively consistent. One of the things you mentioned earlier was, you know, medicine's getting more and more specialized. It's true, and yet all the major medical centers are on isolated pieces of software that have totally separate databases that can't be studied. That's why, you know, well, was Duke, I guess, has the Center for Collaborative Medicine trying to please share the data so these subspecialists can see patients across more geographies that are on different systems that don't harmonize. You can't, you, people will talk about, and it's a beautiful metaphor, and it's worth getting excited about this idea of the super complicated case, but the real opportunity in the next five years for artificial intelligence and machine learning and attendant analysis is, how about the eight million people a year, I'm making up that number, that go from stage one to stage two to stage three cancer without ever being noticed, right? And there's all kinds of basic phenotypical flags. I'm one of them. I'm one of the problem people. 
That stuff is in the current flow of data, but it's not being analyzed. It's not being A, B tested. Wait a minute. Everybody who's got these you know, 23 subtle conditions uh, in, in common are, are going to trip into uh, 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 you know, these really expensive states later on. Once they're in the ivory tower, it's kind of too late for this generation of AI, in my opinion. But what's going on out in the nether, and, and there's cool research and leading edge stuff that's going to make the ivory tower even get intelligence from AI. But in the meantime, the routine stuff. I mean, we just worked with ACOG on a big data product, American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. They're like, we think that a lot of on, 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 uh, obstetricians may be putting uh, their patients on ACE inhibitors, even though they're of childbearing age and not on contraception. Ten seconds later, across 10,000 medical groups, 90,000, we found that 93% of OBGYNs had done that at least once, and that there were 68,000 women in the country right now pregnant or able to get pregnant on a baby-killing ACE inhibitor. Right? Did this, right now, that was a month ago or whatever, this year. This is a current, these are gaping holes in just the routine state of knowledge. And I know with Fortune, we want to talk about the really cool, but right now, taking that kind of baseline, biosurveillance baseline, sort of, digging through the big data set as it gets assembled creates enormous public good and savings without a lot of, you know, at the current stage of invention, at the current swing curve of invention. One more question over here. And for Deborah DeSano, thank you. Um, when we look at neurological diseases, they're typically complex and frequently not of kind of a monogene origin. Is, is Watson you know, developing a strategy around detecting complex diseases and predicting whether this person may in fact um, be at risk for schizophrenia, for Alzheimer's, for Parkinson's um, at specific times in life? The first thing that I want to say is it's very important to us that uh, Watson doesn't do this by ourselves. We do everything with partners. Every single thing we do is with partners. Um, uh, and, and so if we had a partner who wanted to look into that, what we would start with, and this is what we start with, is, is the data that we have amassed and what we see in the data that we have amassed relative to schizophrenia and what can we tell in the data. And then we, we, do, we do scientific experiments. I'm going to go right to diabetes only for a, a lust, illustrative sense of what we do. So um, um, diabetes patients, they, you know, a type 1 diabetic has to make 300 decisions a day to manage their diabetes. And is there a way that we can help them make those decisions? We worked with Medtronic, the partner Medtronic. We looked at 10,000 diabetic patient records. What Watson found was that we can predict a hypoglycemic event two to four hours before it happens. This is gigantic. If you are a type 1 diabetic, you live in fear of having the hypoglycemic event. Now, one year later, which also in healthcare technology is tremendous, we have patients on the Medtronic Sugar IQ app, which helps the type 1 diabetes look at where their, where their blood sugar does and, and pushes, pushes um, um, information to them, specifically for them, hey, here's your blood sugar, get up and walk. Yeah, drink something. At this time of day, you usually do this. Your blood sugar drops. You know, you know maybe you want to take a walk now. Maybe you want to drink something. So um, could we work on that? If a partner wanted to work on that, we would. We would start with the data. We would see what can we find in the data, what connections can Watson make, and then where can we just be really practical like we are in diabetes and helping the patients. I think that's a really good place to focus is that idea of looking for little markers that are kind of, we discover it here when they complain at the emergency room or at the hospital or their doctors. Could we figure out what they have in common with people who are out in the wild right now, right? And say, wait a minute, this person looks a lot like that person. Let's, t let's test them. We're doing a lot right now with Alzheimer's, right? Now, just ourselves. Because it's one of those things that's like, there's little clues. Right, that you could maybe you know enough with someone here, this data set to say, let's just push a survey to this person. You know, let's just push a baseline. Don't tell them we might have Alzheimer's. Just say, hey, doc, can we send this survey to this patient of yours to set a baseline, and the next year we'll send another survey. There's all kinds of things like that, just from the heat seek signature of regular office visits, uh, you know, blood pressure screening, 
mammogram visits, et cetera, that you can do to start to pick up other things. And that's, it's low level in terms of the sophistication of the data that you're getting, but using high level analysis, you can find really gem-like early indicators. I think that's exactly where things are gonna go. Dr. Rattel, I'm gonna give you the last word here because we only have a minute. Well, you know, talking about AI, it's one of the challenges with this discussion, of course, is that we're talking about data that you currently have. The big problem out there, that big black box, is all the data we do not have. That's the challenge, because you know the challenge is that, like David said earlier, David, I said in the first session, prevention is not being practiced as well as it should be. So the problem is we're seeing all these patients too late. We're seeing them when they're already crossed that threshold, where they're already in a deceased state, and you have all these clues that happen ahead of time. So unless we have good preventive treatments and good preventive protocols that actually bring patients in to be assessed and have these features that we're looking for, we're not gonna make much headway to really prevent disease rather than just try to treat it once it happens. <laughs>